This summer, the Bellevue Downtown Association was to celebrate 20 years of Live at Lunch summer concerts, where downtown workers, residents, and visitors gather around for live music during lunch. But things changed, so Live at Lunch changed too. Downtown Bellevue's affinity for live music inspired us to keep the beats coming this summer, now as the heart of Bellevue summer series. We've reimagined our live music experience so you can enjoy the tunes safely and comfortably. We are thrilled to kick off our new series by welcoming self-taught Native American flutist, Peter Ali. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a, a while since uh, I played any kind of event. Quite humbled. And so, anyhow, uh, thank you, um, Bellevue Downtown Association, and thank you, uh, Renaissance uh, events for hosting this today. And uh, I, I live in Bellingham, so it's a nice little drive down. It's a beautiful day. I hope you're able to enjoy it. So I'm going to share some music from my heart. And uh, like was said, I'm self-taught. Everything that I play comes from here. The first flute I played was a Lakota style flute, a plains, plains style flute. And um, uh, the reason I started playing about 20 years ago was to heal. And uh, so for me, this is medicine more than anything else, especially during these days. And um, it helped me connect with my ancestors. If you're curious, I am a uh, diverse ancestry. My father being from Morocco, North Africa, who immigrated here when he was a very young man on the Andrea Doria. And my mom was from uh, across the border into Mexico. And for the longest time, 
because I grew up in California, I didn't know kind of what, who we were, and I'd asked lots of questions. And uh, as I got older, I did some more research and found out that my native ancestry on my mother's side is Mayo and Pima, and that my father, even though he's from the Middle East, we're indigenous as well, um, Berber, the Berber uh, people, they're different tribes in the North African continent. And so I have a rich history of music. Uh, my father's father, my grandfather, was a flute player as well. And um, I'd say this has taken me through uh, and helped me get through some really tough times and also has been a wonderful instrument to play. Um, this next instrument I'm playing is a flute that represents the people of the Southeast, known as the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Iroquois. Uh, it was made for me by a good friend who is a Vietnam veteran, and he's Cherokee and Choctaw. He was a door gunner and a Huey during those dark times in history. And I always think about him when I play this flute. It's in the key of B if you're a music purist. The flutes of the North American tribes were originally only played by the men, and they were used for courting. 
They were also known as love flutes or courting flutes. And um, there's a story behind that as well. They were handmade and they were made out of cedar, traditional wood for flutes in those days. Other tribes had used uh, river cane, which is kind of like bamboo, the people in the southeast. And so um, the flutes, though, never came to this part of the, the West Coast. The tribes here, the Coast Salish people, didn't really have them. Um, they were more in the plains and the Southwest um, and the Southeast. Uh, and upon this journey, when I played for my father, he told me that my grandfather was a flute player. And so, which I was found pretty surprising. And um, he said that uh, he played a very different flute, obviously being from North Africa, from Morocco. He played a flute called the Nai. And it is an ancient instrument, it is as old as native flutes. And they uh, come from Egypt, is I think where they originated. But they're played throughout uh, North Africa right now. The uh, Persians play them, the Turkish people play them as well. And uh, uh, I never knew my grandfather played. I, I met my grandfather when I was a kid, but of course I didn't know to ask because I didn't know. So, so it's in my genes, fortunately. Well, I, I have an, an eye, but it's, they're real hard to play. But uh, I have a, a Native American style flute that's keyed in Middle Eastern key, and it's in the key of A. It's a very haunting sound, and I like to play it. It makes me think of my father and my grandfather and my ancestors.
When I started playing, and I'll share the day with uh, you that I uh, actually came across these instruments. I was living in Paulsbo at the time. And um, I went to a art show, art fair, by the waterfront. And I could hear a Native American flute playing. I thought, oh, this is the best thing ever. So I was drawn to it. And I came upon the vendor table of a, a father and his son. They were selling flutes, and there was a gentleman behind the table playing their flutes. And I've come to meet them and know them as the Stewart family of Stellar Flutes, which is uh, local Washington uh, folks. And the man playing their flutes was Charles Little the well-known Native American flutist from the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon. And uh, they were selling their flutes, of course, and they had them on the table, and they said, hey, you can pick one of these up. And and play one of them. They're easy to play. And I go, oh, no, no, no. I was too bashful. And I didn't know how to play any instrument. So I just listened. And it was it really pulled on my heart. And um, I came back the next day on Sunday and listened to uh, more of the playing. And uh, so I, I felt really moved by that. And I waited about a month. And I drove to Shelton. And I met the flute maker. And he put out some flutes for me to, to, to pick. And um, um, so I picked a, a flute, and that was how it kind of started. It was uh, an Alaskan um, uh, yellow cedar flute in the key of F sharp, I believe. But as I've grown from playing the instrument, I've learned that it wasn't me that picked the instrument. It was the flute that picked me. And I still have that flute to this day, I don't have it with me today here, unfortunately, but um, so that's the one flute that started it all. And I used to be very um, introverted. And so when I started playing, I, I learned and I taught myself. I used to go to the park and play on the ferry boat and uh, going across when I lived on the peninsula. And I got enough uh, nerve to play at an open mic. And that really opened some doors for me. And I met some individuals that uh, uh, I got to play with some really good people. Uh, my friend Swilkanum, you may know him, he's Lummy, he's a violinist, and my friend Gene Tagaban, who is a uh, musician, actor, performer, um, uh, storyteller, as well as Swilkanum. But um, anyhow, this has grown into some really great stuff. And like I said earlier, this was medicine for me, and, and I say that again because uh, about 11 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, this was really helpful for me. Uh, and I was treated uh, in Everett at Providence. And I had to do chemo. And so that was for hours and hours. And so I had asked the staff there, could I bring a couple flutes in to play? And they said, sure. So I did. And it was a third floor in the, in the chemo lounge, as they call it. And all these people were in there getting a treatment. And uh, so it was really uh, beneficial. Um, when I was done with my treatment, I thought of how short life is. Uh, really, it was an eye-opener. And so I would go on my own time and I would show up at the chemo center and I would come and play for those people that are still uh, doing treatment and to give them encouragement and give them hope. Whoever you were, I would do that uh, and whatnot. So anyhow, um, this next flute I'm gonna play is a flute that's modeled after a Mayan style flute. It's a drone, and you'll hear the difference in it. It's made out of cedar. They were normally made out of clay. Uh, a lot of flute makers make them out of wood. And this was uh, made by a local flute maker in Shelton.
So one of the things I liked about coming down to Bellevue uh, was the Festival of the Arts that happens every year. Uh, obviously, this year is going to be quite different. Well, I met a flute maker there uh, also who would come every year from California. His name is Guillermo Martinez. And I have some of his flutes. Um, I have a variety of flutes, though, but him in particular are the bird flutes that I have. And I remember a story that I was told, uh, or I'd heard from my, my clinket friend, um, Gene Tagaban. Usually when I have a live audience, I'd hold this flute up, and I'd say, can you guess what kind of bird this is? And I usually pick somebody out of the audience, and they'd guess it to be an eagle or a crow. And they'd come close, and, I, and they'd figure out what it was. And I'd say, well, what's, what's in the bird's beak? And they'd say, a stone or a seed. And i give them a clue, and i said, on a nice day, it's up in the sky. And so somebody would get it right. But this is a raven, and this carving, this clinket carving, is based on a children's story, How Raven Stole the Sun. And that's what he has in his beak. So I'll play you a song from Raven. playing this was, I remember a time playing in Laconer, um, this flute with another friend who was playing the flute also, it was uh, Upper Skagit, and it was a nice day, and we were just playing together out in the courtyard in town, and I know it's kind of a tourist town, you know, and a lot of people were looking up in the sky, and I'm, I wonder what they're looking at, we're looking up too as we continue to play, and notice there were two eagles, and they were circling right above us. And as long as we played, they stayed. And it was just a really magnificent uh, moment. And when we were done playing, then they left. And I felt 
that day we were truly blessed. So always a story with most of these guys that I have, and I've, I've had them for quite a while uh, and whatnot. I really enjoy playing them. Another Lakota style flute. This is um, like my first one. This is a loon. And this is made by Guillermo Martinez. Uh, it's in the key of F sharp. And it's my second flute just like this. And I have a story about it as well I'll share with you. Uh, every year I play at Folk Life. And uh, I have a lot of flutes to carry. And plus I teach. I have another bag with 30 flutes. And I'm carrying all my stuff. And I. Uh, trying to get to the, uh, uh, one of the parking garages and uh, get all my stuff and I take all my flutes off my straps onto me and everything. And uh, So I get ready to get in my car and drive back to Bellingham and um, guess who I left on the roof of the car? A flute just like this. And I, I learned a really hard uh, uh, lesson on that. Don't leave stuff on the roof of the car. But anyhow, I sent a picture of the instrument to the flute maker and he made me another one and um, pretty close so I'm a, a little bit more mindful so I hope that's not something you guys do so anyways I'll play you a song from my loon
So this, um, this journey that I've been on for almost 20 years has um, opened up a lot of great things for me, other than playing at many different festivals, uh, doing a lot of things for the tribes, and getting to learn more about who I am as a person who's very diverse, like I mentioned earlier on my story. Uh, if you're wondering um, uh, how my parents from two different cultures in such diverse cultures, how they met each other, and I'll tell you a short story. Uh, I did mention that my father came to the United States when he was a young man. I think he was 14 or 15 years old. And he uh, had an uncle that lived in San Diego, California. And so my father had the opportunity to come to the United States. He came over on the Andrea Doria. If you know your history, remember the Andrea Doria? She was the famous Italian steamliner that sunk in the Atlantic Ocean. I believe in the early 50s when she was hit by the Stockholm, the Swedish ship. Uh, the uh, Swedish ship did good, but uh, Andrea Doria went down. Unfortunately, my dad came over before that. But his uncle um, would be my granduncle, Uncle Ahmed. He was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, and he ended up in New York. And so he had to leave Morocco because I guess I didn't find out until a few years ago that my uh, grand uncle was a hitman. Interesting. Uh, and so he ended up in New York, and there he would meet the woman that would be his wife. Now, he met this, this lady who uh, was escaping from her own country at the time, and along with her, she had her sister, her sister's new husband, and her father. And just to kind of give you an idea um, why or where they were in time and history, they left their country because her sister's new husband was German Jew. And so if you know your history, you know that was probably just before the onset of the Second World War. So they got out of there in time. And so they were in New York, and I don't know if they got married there or not, but they ended up in California. And they had a chicken farm. And then after the war, uh, my dad came over, and um, he had to work on the chicken farm to pay his uncle back. And... Um, uh, while he was on the chicken farm, he met this Hispanic worker, and they became friends, and they were able to communicate with each other. Because in Morocco, they speak a variety of languages. Um, they speak Spanish, and they speak French, and they speak Arabic and Berber. And my father, of course, could speak Spanish, and he, they became good friends. He, this man invited my father to his home, which was across the border, uh, in the little town of Ticati. And so when he met this family... Uh, they had an adopted girl, and they didn't like each other at all. Uh, but after a couple of years, they got together, and here I am. And I was born in uh, San Diego County in, in uh, 1957. And so there's uh, five of us total. I'm the oldest. I'm the only one that lives here in Washington State. Uh, if you were born and raised here, uh, you live in paradise. Take good care of it. Um, but the rest of my siblings are all down in... Uh, uh, Southern California in that area. I have, I have two half siblings as part of that group as well. My parents uh, were married for about 19 years, and then my dad I had a second marriage. And so, anyhow, I'm the only musician in the group. So, but uh, anyhow, um, um, I have a couple of kids too. I have an adopted daughter in Seattle and a son in LA. So, anyways, um, uh, I have a bigger family up here and all the places I've taught young people to play at Northwest Indian College and for a variety of Indian uh, education programs. Uh, Eastside Indian Education Program and also Skykomish Valley. Uh, so I've been loving every minute of it. But uh, as I said earlier in this journey, I'm finding out my, uh, my genetics and my ancestors when I, like most people have been doing their DNA, uh, a lot of uh, who I am is obviously from North Africa, uh, Southern Europe, and found that I'm also having ancestors in Siberia, East and West Asia, uh, also towards Finland. And um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, I'm sure you know about the Vikings. They've kind of been everywhere. And the Vikings uh, used to trade with the Berbers in the Mediterranean. It was part of their trade routes. And they traded all kinds of things, sometimes people. <laughs> so um, anyways, this next instrument I'm going to play is from the Nordic country. And uh, this is called a uh, willow flute, a solo flute, uh, uh, if I mispronounce it, please excuse me, a solo flute. 
And it's a very simple instrument. They're made out of willow. There are no finger holes. I also forgot to mention that part of my ancestry, I found them connected to the Sami. And those are the indigenous people of the Nordic countries, the deer herders, and they also play this instrument as well. This one is made out of PVC and um, wrapped in birch bark. And nobody makes these in the U.S. that I'm aware of. I ordered these from a music store in Sweden. So once again, these are called uh, willow flute, uh, salo flute or salafloita. Another fascinating thing about these instruments is the fact that the sound that they produce, sound waves, a lot of different uh, 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 sounds are very healing. And so this one is a, uh, a Toltec flute, the Toltec people. And of course they had uh, clay flutes as well. And um, this one is C sharp and F sharp, and it's in 432nd hertz. And um, it has a very unique sound. I, I really like it. I like playing it. I like to share it with people as well.
Well, let's see. I have a, this isn't one of the smallest flutes I have, but another one of my newer ones. This flute is called Little Dog. And I love the traditional work that's been done on it. This was made by a, a flute maker in Montana. And maybe you probably know who he is, but he's also the flute maker for our Carlos Nakai. And I got to meet our Carlos Nakai um, a couple times. Uh, years ago, he, he played in uh, either Kirkland or Redmond. But I used to uh, facilitate a native flute circle in Snohomish and had a lot of people that loved the, the instrument and would come play and share once a month. And I was able to talk to our Carlos Nakai and have him come and visit us. And he was quite a storyteller and uh, really enjoyed listening to his uh, philosophy on life. But um, anyways, um, I'll play a, a sh or I'll share a song for you and you'll know why this is called Little Dog. And the crowd roars. I really appreciate this experience that I'm getting to do and share with you. It's very different, though. It's a really strange reality. Um, not playing in front of an audience. I do have an audience, though, but you guys are hopefully kicking back and enjoying the, the sounds. For me, it's very healing, like I said earlier. Um, I haven't uh, played since probably the beginning of the year uh, in front of an audience, and that was um, at, uh, at Tulalip at the Hebold Cultural Center. I occasionally get a chance to play there in the, uh, uh, one of the buildings in there. So um, 
so it's been really nice for me because work has been fast paced uh, for me and my day job and stuff. So this has been very helpful. I hope it has been for you as well. Well, I'm coming to that point in the program where I'm going to do one more song for you. Uh, my name is Peter Ali, and I have a website, I believe, that uh, downtown has uh, put a link on there. You can find me on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. Um, uh, I do have a CD out. I did a collaboration with uh, Dean Everson of Dean and Dudley Everson with uh, Soundings of the Planet, which is a label over in the, the Bellingham area, Fairhaven. Um, this, the title of the CD is uh, Prayers in the Wind, and you can locate it easily, Google it, uh, or go to uh, Soundings of the Planet website. Uh, it's uh, nine songs with all of these guys here behind me, with, with Dean Everson, who's been playing music much, much longer than I have. He plays the silver flute, and so we did a collaboration where uh, we improvised. Everything you've heard today, I've improvised. And so, and people go, do you ever play anything that you might be able to recognize? Well, I can play Ain't No Sunshine, but I have to have the rest of the band to play that. So I will leave you with this little song. It's a, a favorite song of mine. It's a short one. So I want to thank again uh, downtown uh, of Bellevue for having this on in resonance. Uh, uh, events also for hosting this, and thank you very much out there. Uh, if you have any questions, come look me up and, and whatnot. So here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Resonance Events, for hosting.
A reminder to join us next Wednesday, July 22nd at noon for a performance from singer-songwriter Jim Skews. Thanks for enjoying the Heart of Bellevue Summer Music Series.